This is a recording from a Sunday meeting of the BC Humanist Association in Vancouver. Humanism is a progressive worldview that, without supernaturalism, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead meaningful, ethical lives capable of adding to the greater good of humanity. To learn more about humanism and to support our work, visit bchumanist.ca and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the BC Humanist Podcast. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of our staff or board of directors. Okay, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Um, his name, well, he goes by Assad, right? Assad. He's going to be talking about restorative justice. Now, I have a brief little uh, comment here, so let me read them. Assad is a PhD candidate and former sessional instructor at Simon Fraser University's School of Criminology in BC. Previously, he was a sessional faculty of Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Fraser Valley and a guest lecturer at the University of the Cows. Victimology and Restorative Justice in Bangladesh. Assad researches restorative justice, nonviolent communication, conflict resolution, peacemaking criminology, and youth justice. He enjoys supporting community based justice organizations and offering introductions to nonviolent communication in prison and in faith based settings. So please join me in welcoming Assad to our meeting today. Assad, thank you. Good morning. So thank you so much for coming in this uh, talk or understanding. I know oh, I just saw Andrew. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for coming today. And uh, this is Sunday, and obviously it's raining. Uh, yesterday was beautiful. Today is beautiful. So both days are amazing. And I am so thrilled to see your interest in understanding of restorative justice. And it's an honor and also privilege to share my journey in the field and also what I experienced and understood from my mentors uh, in the US, in Canada, in Bangladesh. And yeah, these are the three specific settings that I am informed uh, or the practitioner that I am uh, involved with, these are the three places that I will share some examples with you. So there are, I was thinking about today's presentation and then I was thinking about the group as well. And um, I was thinking about PowerPoints and then I was thinking about having a dialogue. I was thinking about uh, just having a conversation on restorative justice. So in the morning, I felt like something came, like I felt, no, let's have a conversation. So, and then I felt that that was strong in me in the morning. So what I will do, I will discuss, like I will explore, I will tell you who am I, and I will give you example how I myself um, kind of encountered restorative justice, and my journey in restorative justice. And then during my journey, I will also give you some examples of some of the models. And then I will try to give you a highlights of history and the roots of restorative justice in Canada, and then specifically in BC, because my doctoral study um, explores the history and growth of RJ in BC, Nova Scotia, and Bangladesh. So that's the kind of my research area. So I will give you some of the highlights. I will give you a few examples. I will also give you a kind of some highlights of some models. And I am mindful that this, it may be the first time that you are getting some ideas about restorative justice. So. Uh, I am completely flexible. If you have any question for clarity, you can ask in the middle. I will be more than happy to explore. I am completely, it's like organic, evolving process. So I trust with the energy that here you have. I truly trust with the interest and willingness of these amazing, wonderful souls who are here today just to explore. So I am just looking forward to this uh, conversation together. And um, about me. Uh, as you can see, my full name is Muhammad Asadullah. So, it's a, so Muhammad is a name that is very common in Bangladesh. Uh, I don't know how, whether you can guess how many people uh, we have in Bangladesh. Any guess in terms of number, total? 100 million? 150 million? 165 million people. In a small, small country, uh, Bangladesh is, at BC is almost 10 times bigger than Bangladesh. BC has 5 million people, or around 5 million. So you can guess. So, and then we have fifth, around 50 million names that start with Muhammad. So, the, <laughs> so the, for example, my dad, he is Muhammad Asad, Muhammad Mahabubur Rahman. My name is Muhammad Asadullah. My younger brother is Muhammad Ashik. So all the names start. It's like Mr. So that's why we all have nicknames. So my nickname is Asad. 
So people know me with Assad. So I would be happy if you call me Assad, or if you call me Muhammad, or whatever makes sense to you. So I'm okay with anything. So that's about me. And it was in 2009 when I first heard about the term restorative justice. So I was, uh, I was studying in the United States. I was doing masters in conflict transformation at a faith-based university. It's called Eastern Mennonite University. So it's a Mennonite school. And um, I went there to study peace building. Because in Bangladesh, we have 2% indigenous communities. And this 2% population had historical conflict with the Bengalis. And that conflict continued for 20, 30 years. I was really disturbed by the conflict. I, I wanted to explore some solutions. So I was just curious to study more about peace building. And one of my mentors from uh, Dickinson College in Pennsylvania suggested me that EMU, Eastern Mennonite University, will be a good fit for you. And then I went there to explore uh, peace building framework, like inter-group uh, conflicts. And then the focus was strategic peace building. So that was my entire focus. How do I resolve this conflict from a government community perspective? So it was a very top-down understanding I had at the time. And I never knew about the term restorative justice. So in that university, I was very fortunate to have a person. His name is uh, Dr. Howard Zeher. He is called grandfather of restorative justice. But I didn't know that he was in that school. But we knew that we have a very famous faculty in that particular university. So it was sometimes in late 2010, when I'm almost graduating. I had this is my last semester. I only have. Uh, Two, two or three credits left. And then some, some, one of my friends, she was suggesting that, did you take any course with Howard? I said, no. And then she said, she's from, she was from Sri Lanka. She said, I said, I really, if you do not take, if you do not meet Howard or do not take a course, it will be a big missing for you. So I just had three credits left, two for practicum and one credit that I can take for classes. So, but his, most of the classes that he was offering for three credits or five credits is like a, and he is like a big shot, like the top faculty in the university. So I just tried to, my goal was to meet him and then have some ideas, nothing else. Because I will be leaving EMU in a few months, why don't I take a class? So I just took three credit course with one credit. So I requested him that can I audit rest of the classes? And he allowed. In that class, I, first class, I was completely shaken, like the, the discussion and the topic and the, like his presence in the class really touched me, like from its core. And that's, it was a week and long class, like so two weeks and then another month, another, uh, sorry, two days and then another month, two days. It's like Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. So like, and then th by the time I was in third class, I really felt a call like what I still consider as a kind of quantum change in me happening. And I was so uh, moved with, um, with the idea and the, and, the, and, the, and the notion and the concepts and the models and everything that Howard was mentioning in the class. And I just told him that, can I take more classes with you? And then he said, you don't have any credits. So I was just auditing all of his classes, all of his classes. He was offering what we call introduction to restorative justice. And then he was offering uh, what, what we call victim of remediation. And then he was offering critical issues of restorative justice. So I took all of those classes, just auditing, auditing, and auditing. And then uh, that became my, my journey. And then I ended up doing my practicum on restorative justice. So I was, and he was so supportive at the time. Howard suggested me that if you would like to do something with restorative justice, you can explore what you have in Bangladesh. And then I said, I, we have nothing. It's like all criminal justice system. It's like completely what, at the time, we have some uh, kind of colonial leftovers from the British Empire. One is justice system, the other is education system that we had. So it's like hugely punitive. And then reoffending rate is very high. And then uh, incarceration rate, especially in minority and uh, poor people, were very, very high. So then he said, but I know that you have indigenous communities in Bangladesh. Do you want to study about their justice system? And that really stood out for me. So I did a kind of active listening project with the indigenous communities for, for six months. So I just listened, listened, because the justice system that these uh, indigenous communities had is all gone. 
because of colonizations and the impact by different imperial uh, invasions, firstly by the Muslims and then by the British, then by the Pakistanis, then by the Bengals. So it's like one after another, one after another. So it completely, but there are some elders who really had like the oral tradition that they had, they had a lot of memories. So I listened and listened, and that became my uh, master's thesis. And then uh, that, was, that was the first, I guess, academic study on indigenous justice in Bangladesh. And then I was, I was curious to study more and more and more and more. So Howard suggested me, why don't you try Simon Fraser University? I still remember he had like a kind of mini sticky notes. And then he mentioned in my, after my thesis, submission or defense at EMU, he wrote a little bit like, you can explore Simon Fraser University. So I had that sticky note, and then I went back to Bangladesh. I was thinking, OK, I think this is the time I can explore for future study. So I wrote to the founding director for Center for Restorative Justice at Simon Fraser University. She is an amazing lady. Uh, her name is Dr. Elizabeth uh, Elliott. Uh, she, this is her book, Security with Care. This is the book that we use in our class as a foundational book in restorative justice. So Liz was in hospital at the time. It was 2011. She was suffering <coughs> from cancer. And I wrote her, uh, and then she suggested me, I said, I'm suffering from cancer. I'm in a very difficult shape. Please contact uh, Brenda Morrison. Brenda is also co-founder, co-director for the Center for Restorative Justice. I contacted her as well. A week, or two weeks later, I got uh, like automatic reply that Liz passed away. And so I never met her, but she was the main reason why actually I came to Canada. And uh, she was a very good friend of Howard Zaher, and she contributed. She is one of the visionaries, or one of the pioneers of restorative justice in, in BC and in Canada. I will talk more about her contribution in the justice system, her contribution in his educational setting, her contribution in community settings, like in so many areas that she, had, she contributed to the movement of restorative justice in Canada, especially in BC. So and then I came in 2011, I, I, so 2012. So I started another master's year and then focused on restorative justice exclusively. And then I did my master's on RJ in a macro setting. So how restorative justice can be applied in the context of war crime and genocide. So that was my focus, and then I studied Rwandan genocide, Cambodian genocide, and how a genocide that happened in Bangladesh in 1971 where three million people were killed, and government for a long time had a policy of let's forget and forgive, as if nothing happened. That didn't work. That backfired in 2009 when the entire country became, like, because they're still not healed, still very angry, still like, I want, we want justice, we want justice. What happened 45 years ago? So the government created a tribunal. It's exactly the opposite of blanket and, or uh, forget and forgive. It's like, let's kill them. So they started arresting all the opposition members and also a lot of um, people who were against the independence in 1971. And they executed many people. And they are planning to execute more. So and then my goal in my thesis was to explore third way, what Desmond Tutu Archbishop Desmond Tutu called a third way to deal with any kind of war crime and genocide. So that was my master's thesis. And then I was teaching at UFV for a year. And then I started PhD in 2015. And my right now, my focus at this moment is to explore the history and growth of RJ in BC, Nova Scotia, and Bangladesh. So why Nova Scotia, I will share more. And why BC, I will share more in a few minutes. Uh, but before I share about, so what I will do, that's about just a basic background of me. And um, my experience with restorative justice came from educational setting, from prison system, my volunteering with different prisons in the US, in Canada, in Bangladesh, and then also in communities. For example, I do some work with North Shore Restorative Justice Society. There is another organization called Vancouver Association for Restorative Justice Society. It's called VARGE. And there is another organization called Touchstone Family Association. It's in Richmond. So I do have experience supporting and involving with these three organizations in a voluntary and professional capacities. So what I would like to do before I share about restorative justice, I would like, I'm curious, like, how many of you know about restorative justice? Like, just raise your hand. OK, fantastic. Uh, if you don't mind, just a pop concern, what do you know? Any one or two sentences do you like, do you like to share? if you don't mind. There was a fellow on TV not long ago who uh, had 
murdered someone and he met with, I think it was his daughter, of the, the murdered daughter, and they hugged and like the whole system worked very, very well for them. And they were very happy with it. They for, uh, she forgave him for killing her father and, and wanted to know how it, you know, what took place. And he explained it all. And it's just, uh, it, it, it was very good. It was on TV, not, not more than maybe a month and a half ago or so. Yeah. So on the, on the, uh, on the news. Yeah. And you are, your name is Jake. Jay. That's also like, we have a lot of high profile cases in Canada, including Margaret, who met her father's killer. She's an amazing, uh, the story that she shared with communities is powerful, inspiring and touchy, like the way the exploration between the victim and the offender and the way reconciliation or healing journey is so unique. And she shared eloquently in different communities and that's wonderful. Yeah, that's the person, Margaret, yeah. Uh, there are many other high-profile cases in Canada, but Margaret is the one where we have, like, it's from BC, and the person who murdered, he is doing amazing work in Abbotsford. Yeah, and I can share more. But So in Rwanda, the there is a court called Gachacha Court, so where the Hutus and Tutsis, they came together, because before this, they had a, a call, they call International Crime Tribunal in Rwanda, so where they started arresting millions of people, because during their civil war or genocide, the entire Hutus participated. It's like hundreds, hundreds of people. So the prison system was full of these Hutus, Hutus and, the, and then they started. So the option that they had is South African model, like how do I find how do we find a way that is more supportive to the community? So that that's what exactly they did. Thank you for mentioning that. Who anybody would like to share about something you know about restorative justice, please? As you're aware, and if you look at Canada, we we have a very we we also have a specific problem with Indian incarceration because, as you know, First Nations occupy four percent of the populations. Males are incarcerated at twenty three point two percent. Females at thirty six point one percent. So the First Nations have actually been basically some of the leaders in our country in trying to use restorative justice, particularly crimes between First Nations and First Nations people. And they've been, I, I think they've been having some difficulties because of course that, that requires a change to our legal system, but it's kind of a, a bright light that we can be looking at down the road. Yeah, and you are uh, Murray. Murray. That's also like Ex fantastic, like the First Nations community, First Nation peoples in Canada, I will share there are three specific routes how RJ came to Canada. One of the routes is obviously First Nation peoples and their work and their practices. And I will share more. And you are right, the way they contributed and influenced our practices, not only here, all over the world. I will share more. Asad, I ran in first into restorative justice when I was working with... Uh, patients that had been traumatized as a result of some kind of crime. It could have been a sexual assault, a physical assault, or things like that. And <clears throat> there was a program in Phoenix where they took prisoners out that had committed these types of crimes and met with their victims in a very uh, controlled environment, and they did all kinds of activities together in a way that acknowledged both of their uh, pain not only the pain of the victim, but the pain that had uh, the abuser had also experienced in their life. And one of the results of it is that the belief is that most criminals don't really uh, have a strong empathy with their victim. And for the first time, some very psychopathic personalities actually begin to experience empathy with their victim, which is a huge human trait that we need to develop. <laughs> and you are Marty. 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 That's, that's profound as well, like the, the encounter between the victim and the offender. There are, there are um, many studies and examples not only in Canada, all over the world, how uh, this is like a, a, a mysterious journey between victim and the offender when they meet together. They find somehow that conflict or that particular incident or that horrendous crime happened and they are connected because of that. And the journey between those two people from denial, anger, frustration, to the healing and to restoration to this community building or to this transformation is, is, is magic. 
And I, there are many examples, but one of the obvious examples is Margaret and other examples. Uh, um, there are many examples we have in Rwanda, many examples I can share from Bangladesh. So there is that magic and there is um, that empathy, that humanness, that connection. And then also when that offender understands the impact of that, if, even if it is $10, that I stole $10 from Marty, but that stealing $10 had significant impact of his well-being, that understanding doesn't happen during the court process or during if I put that person in prison. But that happened because when I hear all those effects, and that contribute also towards acknowledgement and then acceptance and then remorse and then slowly, I'm sorry for that, and then taking a specific action. So that is that magic happened during the process of what we call victim of remediation. Thank you for sharing, Marty. Is that a little bit like Sharia law as well? When in the case of murder, when you have the victim and the and the offender together, and they negotiate a price for the crime that was committed, and um, isn't that that also is restorative justice? Where and and, and Muhammad he says those that forgive and and don't take the life of the criminal or whatever, they they are um, God loves them the most, and so he was really in favor of not of finding great empathy with with the opponent, or sorry, the aggressive um, in the case of murder and forgive is better than um, expecting huge payment. Thank you. So forgiveness is an interesting because <clears throat> by and large, most of the restorative justice practices, uh, there is a consensus among the academics. One person I will mention he is John Braithwaite from Australia. He's like top criminologist and he's another. So we have two grandfathers. One is uh, uh, Howard Zeher, he is one of the grandfathers. Another grandfather, some people also call him grandfather, is John Braithwaite from Australian National University. He developed a theory called reintegrative shaming theory. He is the founder or the pioneer of the theory, shame management theory or reintegrative shaming. John, in his book, he mentioned forgiveness. Is, so he has three specific, three types of values that is a kind of fundamental for restorative justice. One he call foundational values that we have to have it. Otherwise you cannot call it restorative justice. Respect, relationship, responsibility, safe, safe space for all stakeholders, participation, fundamental. You, we have to have it. And then there are some values what John call it um, maximizing values. R relationship, maximizing values, communication, and then um, restitution, and then uh, amends, all those. And then he, there are some values what he call as a gift. You cannot impose. It cannot be conditioned for restorative justice. Forgiveness is one of them. It can come, it may come, but it, it is not a condition for, m by and large, most of the RJ practices. But this is, uh, if you have it, it's a blessing. If you have it, this is a gift. So that's what he call uh, values that are that are uh, like an outcome, but do not be a condition for most of the RJ process. And there are many studies on the notion of forgiveness, how how it works, how a lot of time it takes um, it takes its lifelong journey for some, and it may take for a few months and few for others. But that's an interesting. Thank you for mentioning that. So I think my sense from you all of or is there anyone who would like to share about your experience or understanding of restorative justice? Yeah, I just have a comment. I used to work for the John Howard Society, which is involved with uh, um, pr primarily men in the prison system and helping them transition into life outside. Um, and I had contact with a young bank robber <clears throat> who ended up doing time, of course, and he wanted to meet with the teller who he was holding up, who he terrified, and tell her <laughs> that he was sorry and he was not allowed to mm. and he carried that with him thank you and your name is Joanne thank you for sharing and John Howard Society is is the champion is the is the organization in the whole country they are doing uh, in terms of move, like a movement they are number one in creating momentum in restore in Manitoba they are the organization who are doing everything in justice reform in BC, they are doing amazing work all over the all over Canada. So thank you for mentioning John Howard Society and Elizabeth Francis. These two organizations they are the champion for restorative justice work, and um, that's the sad. Sometimes, like most of the RJ practices, what we call victim-led. If, for example, Assad stole ten dollars from uh, Murdy, and then if I am interested to meet 
murdy but he is not interested he is not willing then it will not happen because it is mostly victim led victim centric that's the foundation as one of the principles and in many cases like uh, what you mentioned uh, offenders are interested to say sorry to meet that person to really express their genuine remorse but victims are not ready to listen and you cannot do anything it's a completely voluntary process whenever he or she is ready you can have a process so that's that's one of the reasons why in prison systems many offenders they are not getting opportunities because they are um, the, and that's why we have a program what we call victim offender encounter where you can meet a victim but it's not your direct victim it's called surrogate victims so you can find somebody with a similar crime and then share your for example uh, remorse and feelings and acknowledge and then that's a kind of healing for surrogate victim as well because this is not a direct victim so that there are some programs in canada there are some programs in the us they use that model anybody would like to share something about restorative justice please uh the victim impact statements in the court where the victim you know tells the accused everything about how they feel but i'm not sure how that works from the from the accused point of view i mean it's a one way thing and so i don't know if that's useful or if that's part of restorative justice or not you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. thank you yeah victim impact statement um, that's the only outlet that we have in the justice system where a victim can share something but in a very very structured way you cannot go beyond that structure that's the problem it's like very formal process of sharing your emotion but our emotion is so raw if, if, if i have one specific incident it was myself so myself studied in the uk she is doing her phd in cambridge so i was in the uk for a few months with her and then um the place we were living is completely safe and wonderful and most of the time we kept our door open at night and then on 31st night last year uh somebody came somebody entered and got our house and then stole and all everything all like credit card and all other things and it was really like and then in the morning we woke up we said wow it's go- it's gone this is gone this is gone and then we called 911 the police came and then they after a few hours they arrested the person so i left guys i am here and i left uh, around like mid january and then my wife really was struggling uh, to sleep at night because she was like waking up in that night even though that person who stole is like the credit card and then he stole few 100 pounds but the effect that it had on her that she couldn't sleep and then i'm here i'm really thinking what is going on and then the police came and then only she had his specific form for victim impact statement but that's like very limited a few limited in words limited in structure also the effect it had on me the effect it had on our relationship on our discussion that did that was not included in the victim impact statement so that's the kind of the only outlet at at, at, this, at this moment we have in the justice system but during the encounter with the like all restorative justice models it is much more relational much more organic and much more healing than structured way and that's why many victims like in most of the studies we have all over the world on restorative justice victim satisfaction is more than 90% victim satisfaction rates in those programs are significant number so that's that's because of this en- encounter okay so what i will do now i will share my understanding how restorative justice started and then hopefully i will give you some highlights and then from there if you have any question we will go from there is it okay wonderful so documented in a kind of um, a fast documented case that uh, that we can recall or that the academics included in the in the book or in articles is 1974 remember the 1974 waterloo kitchener so there was this two young offender who violated or vandalized 22 houses 1974 waterloo kitchener and then the probation officer in that particular case knew these two young men they didn't have any previous criminal record so um he really wanted to do something different and then he went to judge that uh these two young men i knew they didn't have any criminal record uh, is there anything i can do different than putting them to the court system 
judge had no clue what he is suggesting what what he was suggesting so just okay i trust you so if you want to try something different why don't you try and then this probation officer went to community and then met one of the Mennonite volunteers in that area. And that Mennonite volunteers and himself designed uh, what he at that time called Victim Offender Reconciliation Program, VORP, V-O-R-P, 1974. And then he invited these two young men in a community center, invited these 22 families in that community center just having what happened and the impact that it had in the community. So surprisingly, all of these 22 families came in that community center, including these two young men and the probation officer and the Maronet volunteers. And then they shared what happened. And then they shared these two young men. They were bored. They had nothing to do. They were just coming from school and just vandalized one door, another door, another car, another uh, garden, so just whatever they had in front of them, they just vandalized. They were a little bit drunken as well at the time. And uh, so when they came, uh, these 22 families, they shared how that act of violence completely disrupted their sense of safety, autonomy, security, and everything, even the sense of community. And then they were shaken to see the impact, just their act of boredness. They were bored and they had nothing to do, that's why they did. And they really were moved. And after that, they came with a kind of community agreements. Why don't you do these and these and these? And then these two young men followed. And then probation officer and Mennonite volunteers supported them to follow those agreements. And one of these two young men now, he is a PhD doctor. He is teaching in a university. The other one is one of the, like, he's a big, like, successful business person. So there is, there is still, there is a documentary on them uh, we have in Canada. So that's the first documented case on restorative justice in Canada. 1974, Waterloo Kitchener. And the model they used at the time is called Victim Offender Reconciliation Program, VORP. That VORP later on became Victim Offender Mediation, VOM, or some places called Victim Offender Conferencing. Right now, more than 50 countries in the world, they use that model. And Margaret, that you mentioned, that's one of the models that used. In the, that's the story of a kind of, um, from a faith tradition. So Mennonites from Waterloo Kitchener, then in BC, Langley Mennonite Fellowship, they also contributed from 1982. They did all RJ programs in the province. So this is one of the roots that how restorative justice started in Canada, Mennonite traditions, the Quakers, faith traditions. They contributed to the notion of victim of mediation, victim of reconciliation program, and victim of conferencing program. That's one. The second route that how we guess restorative justice came to Canada is uh, indigenous communities. So they have a most of the First Nations uh, communities, they have what they call peacemaking circles. Something happened, they invite the elders, community members, and then everybody, whoever av available, and share what happened, what can we do together to resolve that conflict. So the, the practice that came from First Nation peacemaking circles uh, is one is called sentencing circle. So a judge in Yukon, his name is Barry Stewart. He started, he was the judge in the Yukon territory in 1990s, and he saw in the court process um, it's like a revolving door. People are coming and coming and coming. So he included in his court system the nation, the elders, and everybody. And then that became what we call sentencing circle. And then there is another practice came from First Nation, like for example, downtown community court, First Nation courts. It's like some you have some um, elements of peacemaking circles in the process, even though. There are a lot of uh, challenges, for example. It's not exactly healing. There is a steel court system. There is still uh, the hierarchy, power hierarchy. It's still not non-hierarchical. still not completely inclusive. But there are some remnants of sentencing circle and peacemaking circle in those practices. That's the second route, how restorative justice practices were influenced in Canada or uh, Muslim Canada. Yeah. The last one is uh, what we call uh, people like Howard Zeher, Liz Elliott and uh, John Braithwaite, they are, I call them peacemaking criminologists or peace builder or feminist or uh, critical criminologists. 
they were very critical. One person I would, I would like to share, his name is Nils Christie. He is a critical criminologist from Norway. He wrote an article in 1977. It's called Conflict as Property of the Community. So he felt, for example, conflict I have with uh, Sonia. If I have a conflict with her, so this is like our property. Then state came, stole that property, and then the professional, he used a very strong word. He said the lawyer and the judges are professional thieves. They stole our conflict. Now they want to solve our problem. So that's 1977. And that article made a huge impact all over the world. And then uh, he gave a lot of examples from Tanzania, Papua New Guinea, how in those countries, uh, uh, conflicts are not stolen by the lawyer and the judges. They know how to resolve. And then later on, uh, Barry Stewart from Yukon, he, he followed Nils Christie's argument. He said, because now this conflict is gone. Now I don't know how to handle my conflict with Sonia. So I call 911. So that's how I have 911 mentality, because I don't know how to solve it. Because, that, because of that state came and then stole this conflict, now I don't know how to resolve. It's all 911. So that's the reason why 911 mentality came. So Nil had huge impact. That article, I, I will be happy to share with Ian if you would like to share. That article is a small article, but had impact on the movement. And then another person who coined the term restorative justice, he is a British uh, probation officer. Uh, his name is Robert Eglash. In 1977, during the same time, he, he was working on restitution and uh, community agreements. And then he saw how, in by and large, most of the court process, only they are collecting 2% restitution, 5% maximum. It's not working at all. The restitution in the entire court process is not happening because it's not people are not providing or paying back. So then he tried to find some creative way, and then he called the term restorative justice. So that was the time, first time that person used restorative justice. But the momentum came with this book. This is the book that created the big shift in minds, I guess, or in worldviews. So changing lens, so what Howard is saying, that we can talk about all those practices, but if we do not, this is a different worldview, fundamentally. If we do not change our worldview, whatever practices we have, we will, we will get the same result. So why don't, like, we, this is much more fundamental than the practices that we're, we're talking about. So what said, for example, crime, what is the definition of crime in Canada? Crime is a violation of criminal code, simple. Or crime is a violation of law. Crime is a violation of some specific laws that we have in Canada. And then what he said in restorative justice, crime is also a violation of relationship. It's not only a violation of law, it's also a violation of relationship. So if, for example, if you put me in prison for a few months because I stole $500 from Sonia, you are restoring the law, but my relationship with Sonia is gone. It doesn't restore, it's, it's further because I'm in prison, she's in the community, she's still grieving, I'm enjoying my jail time, and then becoming more like a, I am you know, like a kind of numbed. I have no idea what impact she had. I had no idea that her relationship and then her, all those, how ripple effect it had on her, around, around her. No idea because I'm completely oblivious. And then I am back to the community and then do again and again and again. So that re relationship is that Howard came, Howard brought to the, to the idea, to the minds, that if it, is a, if it is a violation of relationship, how do I restore now? So then the process is different. Outcome is different. Thinking is different. So that's the kind of fundamental shift that is starting with the definition of crime. And then um, he mentioned, like for example, crime creates what he called obligation. So now it's an obligation for both of us to what do we do? And then um, what are the needs? So a lot of focus on needs, a lot of focus on mutual obligations, a lot of focus on relationships. So these are the three ideas that Howard promoted a lot in his book, and he called it, it's a different lens. It's not the less that state-based system or Eurocentric worldview or a Newtonian worldview that we have where you say this is, this is, these are the rules, follow it, these are the rules. So he made it uh, very clear that if we do not change our framework in mind, 
then it will not be working. And during that time, prison abolitionists, they also joined the board. They said this is something we also would like to support. Feminist movement came. They also supported their, their articles and writings about fairness, inequalities in the system, and uh, especially with uh, specifically the systemic oppression in Can uh, in U.S. context is first uh, African American population. It's in, st like a staggering number right now. In the U.S., they have more disenfranchised African Americans than they had slaves. Disenfranchised means they cannot vote. They have nothing, no social services. So they have more disenfranchised African Americans than they had slaves. There is a book by Michelle Alexander. It's called New Jim Crow Law. It's an amazing book. She is an amazing professor, and she had like all those statistics, staggering number. Same thing in Canada, First Nation peoples, like the only 5% of the community, of the people, but in prison system, more than 70%. So it's like staggering number, and the colonial impact, uh, intergenerational trauma, and uh, these dysfunctional communities that they had because of all those challenges, it's, it's insane number. And so what he was saying, Howard, and then also all other groups, they're saying that we need to completely focus our mind and then we can explore more holistic understanding of re restorative justice. So Howard Zeher, John Braithwaite, they gave a theoretical framework uh, during the almost like 1980s and 90s. It was a lot of intellectual theories coming. And then a number of theories from criminologists also came to the idea that this is um, in line with what we call labeling theory in criminology, integrative shaming theory, procedural justice theory, and then uh, there is another theory called affect theory, and then shame management. Th those theories all contributed to the development of restorative justice. So right now, there are more than 100 countries in the world that use some form of restorative justice, more than 100 countries. And Canada is is like the poster boy, one of the poster boys. So New Zealand is a good, like a, they have, their justice system is much more inclusive with restorative justice than any other country in the world I can think of. Scandinavian countries, they do not use, like sometimes they, they have well, like welfare model of justice system, complete focus on reintegration, almost zero focus on punishment. So that's a kind of different model because of their, the way nation state work, the way their entire justice system works is different. But in New Zealand, they are kind of early adopters in the field of restorative justice. Then Canada is also, because the, there are some famous models that we have in Canada. One is what I mentioned, victim of mediation. Another is circles, peacemaking circles. And there are some other programs for sex offender that Canada pioneered. So those programs right now are like all over the world. So that's a kind of brief history of restorative justice. Any question about the history? Do you have any question or any comments for clarity? Well, you said for clarity after I picked up my hand. It isn't for necessarily for clarity. But in the States, the uh, African-American population in prisons I know is higher. But a lot of that has to do with drug, in quotes, crimes. A lot of it is what you know. some of us have done on our own, and we didn't get jail because we didn't get caught. Uh, and some of it is, is you know, harder drugs. But still, it's you know, people take drugs not sometimes because they're bored, sometimes because they're in pain. It isn't like, oh, I want to take a drug because I want to end up in jail. But uh, so there, I mean, that's a, a different case. For, well, to some extent in Canada, the First Nations is, a, is some of its drunkenness, but I don't think they end up in prison so much as overnight or two nights in jail. It's a little bit different. Uh, there's... I don't think you can compare the two countries, I guess, uh, their jail populations, that's all I'm... Thank you, that's a good point, Laura. Thank you so much for mentioning. In, I agree, like in the US, Ronald Reagan, his drug, war on drug policy, and then followed by Bill Clinton. If you read Michelle Alexander, he, she clearly mentioned how, even though it was called war on drug, but that has a specific target on a specific group of people. Even right now, if you read what is happening in Oakland, California, the entire marijuana industry, there is numerous studies like who, which specific ethnic group uses more marijuana and which specific ethnic group is more punished. You can, I, I don't have to give you the statistics. You can just, there are numerous studies that found. So that's what, like, even though that was war on drug, but that has a specific political 
ideological target to specific groups. So that's obviously the history in, uh, in the United States, and there are many books. And then also public school. There are many books on what we call prison pipeline. From, so public school is like a prison pipeline. There are many studies how entire public schools in the US is designed towards prison system. So and the, how do we disrupt this prison pipeline? There are many studies as well, books. Harvard universities, they have many students that are doing PhD, how to disrupt this prison pipeline, and mostly one specific ethnic group. And uh, obviously, the fascination of their history is different. I agree with you. The, the, the colonial impact and then the issues with all other effects that they had because of this encounter, including intergenerational trauma that they have and pain. It's like, and the way they are treated here is a co completely different context. And I agree, like the way they're, but what I'm saying, unfortunately, their interaction with justice system is very high. The way their interaction with justice system in the United States with African American population. And the way, for example, Maori indigenous communities in, Australia, in, in, in New Zealand had encounter with justice system a lot. And that's why in New Zealand, Maori community, the indigenous population had huge impact on creating a model that will help that will be helpful for them. And I see right now because I do a lot of work with Reconciliation Canada, for example, how with TRC and the way as a Canada as a country is moving, it's it's mind boggling the way reconciliation work is happening, the way dialogue is happening between First Nation and non First Nation. It is amazing. It's like one of the one of the hopes that I have in this completely hopeless world to see how communities from all over, like if you go to Nova Scotia, if you go, if you're here, if you go to Duncan, any islands, everywhere you see people are exploring calls for action and reconciliation. How do I explore that and implement in the school districts? Uh, I know Vancouver school districts, um, West Vancouver school districts, North, North Vancouver school districts, Langley school districts, they're all like looking for ways, how do I support my brothers and sisters who, are, who had this historical trauma, who had these intergenerations. So it's an amazing story, amazing inspirational story here in Canada. But what I'm saying, like, these are the groups that had more impact with the justice system. And that also like, kind of contributed to the movement as well. They became one of the good allies in supporting the entire justice system. So at this moment in BC, we have around 67 organizations, 67, who are promoting restorative justice. And out of 67, 27 of these organizations are from indigenous communities. It's exclusively to support them. And there are numerous Supreme Court decisions, including Gladue decisions. And then another is uh, R versus Plux, major cases. I have a handout that I will share with you. I mentioned those cases that also contributed. This is exclusively for the First Nations. And they mentioned that before, to, before giving any verdict, judge, should recommend all community options that available before sentencing him or her. So that's major. And the reason why that came because of major breakdown from the justice system we had, targeting to specific groups. And then obviously Youth Justice Act that came in 2003 that had specific sections, section 718, and then criminal court 7, 718 included all programs specifically supporting indigenous communities because of a reason. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an amazing story here in Canada, the way it's happening. Any other comments on the history? So I, I always find this shocking. It's 5% uh, uh, indigenous peoples in Canada, but 70% in the prison system. And uh, this is 2018. I wonder why we're talking about it now. Why wasn't it fixed 50 years ago, 100 years ago? Who are the people who are not able to see that? And Why in the world? And And... and I mean, it looks like it's all changing a lot now, but it's certainly taken a long time. Just one other comment I wanted to mention, uh, a, a humorous news story about the name Muhammad. Uh, back about 2005, maybe, uh, they had so many people named Muhammad Muhammad that they decided to give them the option of having a third name so that they could sort out who they were. So guess what name they chose? <laughs> Most of them chose Muhammad, so from Muhammad squared to Muhammad cubed. Oh, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's also, yeah. There are some sports person who when they, like if there is a team from Egypt playing against Saudi Arabia, so the people who are commenting, Saul Muhammad is passing from one to another to another. <laughs> <laughs> 
So people are confused which which player has the ball. Which player which player has the ball? Yeah. So that's the history. And if you do not have any specific question for clarity, I will go with the definition. How do you define restorative justice? So definition is tricky because um, up until now, there is no consensus among the academics and practitioner what is restorative justice. If you ask me, I will have one specific answer. If you ask Howard, he will have another answer. And then I still remember in our class, um, Howard asked, okay, what is your definition of restor restorative justice? And the university that I went at US, in US, it is very international university, so we have 25 students from 20 countries. It's very global, so people from Africa, West Africa, North Africa, East Africa, to South Asia, to Latin America, and to obviously North America. So it was a huge group. So the definition of justice and restorative justice, it was all different from Eastern Africa to West Africa to all those other areas. So that's why uh, there is, that's what Howard think that that's also good for the practice, for the movement, that we do not have any consensus on the definition. That's a good thing because then it will be a box then innovation and creativity will be lost. So that's a kind of their own reasoning why we should not have a consensus on the definition. So, but the broader spectrum that we have in the field is there is one camp they call um, process-based camp. So processed restorative justice is all about a process and a process and a process. So there is one camp and that camp is mostly academics. They belong to this camp. A lot of academics from Australia, UK, many studies are happening in the UK as well. So they feel restorative justice is a process where you have a victim and the offender and the community and you follow a guiding principles and that's what restorative justice is. There is another group who are here, they will say it's not about the process, it's about the outcome. So if you can restore relationship between Assad and Sonia, so relationship is the outcome, or connection is the outcome, or more understanding is the outcome. Whatever process we did, it doesn't matter. We may have a, co for example, coffee talk, or we may have just, a, we may have dancing together. Something happened during the dancing, we didn't talk. Or we may have a music. We were just listening or playing music, and then some magic happened, then that restoration happened. So it's not about the process, it's about the outcome. So that's another camp. And there is another camp in the middle who will say it's both. It is a theory of justice, where we have some specific expectation, like accountability, relationship, re transformation. Uh, we have those ideas as an outcome. And also, it's a process where we need, uh, we need f key stakeholders, what Howard called the people who are affected by the crime most. It might be the victim and the offender, and then his or her family members, and people around him or her friends, him or her around her, so, and the, all those people who are affected by the crime, they, they are included, they should be included in the, in the process. So we have the, like a purist who will say, no, it's about the process. If you do not have victim, offender, and a trained facilitator, you cannot call it restorative justice. These are the three fundamental stakeholders. They will call it, you have to have it. If you only have offender and surrogate victims, no, we, can call, we cannot call it restorative justice. If you have victims and surrogate offender, we cannot call it restorative justice. If you only have, for example, a few victims, they're meeting here and they're doing their own, like for example, listening each other, supporting each other. There are many programs for, exclusively for victims. Same thing, there are many programs exclusively for offender. One of the best programs we have in, in BC is called AVP, Alternatives to Violence Project. AVP is very famous programs in most of the correctional services of Canada, most of the uh, federal prisons, we have that program. So what happened in that program? We have community members like yourself who go to those prisons, like I, I do also that as a volunteering, and then we meet uh, on Cinema Month. We have few themes, for example, one theme might be relationship, community building, uh, anger, um, relationship. And then on those themes, we have few experiential learning activities because many of those inmates have cognitive difficulties. So they really l enjoy learning by doing. So what we do, we do those experiential learning activities in prison on those themes. And then it, uh, and these programs are co-designed. So one of the inmates and one of the community volunteers. So it's always co-led 
co-designed and co-implemented by one of the inmates and one of the, that's the beauty of the programs and 100% volunteers. And it is, um, there are two master's thesis on these programs in BC. What they found is like the people in the prison who are involved with the AVP, their reoffending rate is almost zero or less than 5% those who are involved with this program in the prison. But it's, it's only for the, offender, for the offender. So victims are not at all involved in the process. And there is another program, it's called um, Circles of Support and Accountability, COSA. That's also uh, famous in BC. It's a specific for sex offender. So Circles of Support and Accountability, COSA program. So they have a few volunteers from the community. They have what they call core group. They meet three months before the release. So they have specific plan for housing, specific plan for job, specific plan for relapse prevention, all community members. And the person who is the sex offender, he or she they themselves are part of the team, the plan, and then they implement together. And it has huge success in, the, in, in, in Fraser Valley. I know the person who is the head of the program, he was mentioning the other day that they had 94 uh, core members, they call core member, the sex, they don't use the word sex offender, they call core member, they had zero reoffending, zero. Staggering outcome, like it's uh, insane, like if you think of outcome the way it, it, these programs are having, it's huge. So this is, again, this program is exclusively for offender, and I call it restorative justice, but the Puritan, the purists, they will not call it restorative justice, because they will call, no, this is only, where is the victims, where are the community members? But the way, the values and principles that, so right now I follow Liz Elliott. So what she said, like RJ programs is not about the process and the outcomes, it's about the values and principles. So there are some fundamental values and principles, including respecting each other, non-hierarchical setting, uh, inclusiveness, patience, forgiveness. There are many, uh, empathy, compassion. So there are many values and principles that so many practitioners mentioned, and I have an article that I will be happy to share with you exclusively on values and restorative justice. And uh, that's what most of the programs that we have that run under those values and principles. And um, I see that's the direction where the field is going right now. So the people who were process-based, they continued their uh, kind of dominance in 1990s. And that's why RCMP got involved in restorative justice in Canada. So RCMP in 1994, they really felt that it's like buzzing all over the world. So few police officers, they went to Australia, they went to UK, they went to New Zealand to study what is going on there. And they were really, blo blo like they were really impressed to see the outcome. So they started a model in Canada, it's called Community Justice Forum, CGF. That started in 1994, and then it became the model in Canada. They, they, because they had money, so they trained hundreds of volunteers for free. It's free training, free training all over Canada. And that program, or that specific model, is, uh, the, it's also a written model, what we call script-based model. So that, that is uh, because they had money, they had a specific uh, buying from RCMP and all other policing agencies that program became very, very famous all over Canada. And then later on in early 2000 or mid 2010 or later on around that time, community members are not feeling because this script-based model does not make connection. You are, you are just reading out some handouts. It doesn't have that organic connection that happened in a non-script format. So that's why Community Justice Initiative in Langley, North Vancouver Restorative Justice Society, North Vancouver, and then, um, Victoria Restorative Justice Program, these three programs, they became role model for non-script based RJ program. And it's very, very fluid. They, these programs are based on some values and principles. So in summary, what I'm saying that there is no consensus on the definition of restorative justice, but you have three camps. One is process-based camp, another is outcome-based camp, another is value and principle-based camp. So, and I will give you a handout, in that handout I have some definitions that you can see, and that's a part of my thesis. So I just uh, printed and copied and gave it to you, but I didn't put all the citations. If you need citations, you can email me. I can give you, because I have all the citations listed, but the reference section is almost 10 pages. So I didn't include that, I just put only two pages for you. So. <laughs>
it will be too much hassle yeah the issue is is that at that particular time i was involved in working with gangs in the la area which was experiencing a tremendous rise and so i was working at a delinquent school and housing facility and in my discussions with the directors there, we became very aware that in gang behavior as a subculture, there are very different types of criminals. And I think one of the things that restorative justice has done is it doesn't treat everybody the same, which is one of the problems of the Leviathan when it got going. With long lineups, you just, you did the crime, this is the sentence, and then if you're a repeater, the sentence goes up. One of the things that I found in my research in gangs is there was a passive, non-conforming member of the gang who actually was not a psychopath, was actually a pretty nice person, but to belong and to have a subgroup, they kept being involved in gang behavior. And so I worked with that subgroup. I worked with 120 of these nicer but somewhat impressionable you know, 14 to 18 year olds, and I gave them a form of training so that when the gang leader said, we're gonna go out there and get that son of a bitch, we're gonna kill him, they had a response. Because many of them didn't want to participate in that, but they didn't know how to save face. So I gave them what was called a mental kung fu treatment, which is a way to stand up to the leader that was clever, got a little cynicism going, and questioned what the leader was doing. And when these guys went back onto the street with this kind of training, they had an impact in their particular neighborhoods to be able to not follow the leader blindly. So one of the things about restorative justice that I've liked as I've been involved is we don't treat the offender the same. They all are very different. They're motivated by different things. And when you recognize that, you can actually make some form of justice that can help them not to reoffend and understands their circumstances for why they committed the crime, which often is very different. Thank you, Mary. That's uh, that's well said and well documented. Thank you so much. And the notion of belonging is interesting. Belonging. Um, I will close my remark today with one of the examples I will give uh, is from uh, there is a there is a prison in Canada, especially in Harrison. It's called Healing Village. That's the name of the prison, Healing Village. And there are 50 inmates. No reoffending for the last many years. And they don't call themselves as offender, they call resident. And they have an elder, that elder is the head, of, and the, including the warden. And they run, this is the most successful prison in Canada at this moment. And one of the key reasons of su their success is social capital. The volunteers who go to those programs and support these inmates from Harrison to Vancouver, all other areas, the connection that they have <coughs> There is one inmate, I personally know him for the last five years. He was carrying three life sentences. It, it, he killed one person inside the prison. So he was in super maximum security prison. It's called SHU. It's like the maximum security prison and the super maximum security prison. He was there. And then he came to minimum, medium, and then he... When I met him, he was in a minimum security prison. He used to come to my class as a guest speaker. And he's sharing, and then one thing contributed his journey most is social capital, belonging that he had from community members. He said, Asad, I never felt that I was a human. I was treated as a number, number and number and cons. But these community members reminded me that I'm a human being and I have a name and I have a place to go to the community. And then what he said in his all probation, he violated so many times, but the thing contributed most is the social capital and belonging that, that, that he built because of these programs. And right now he's a chef working in one of the hotels and uh, I will be inviting him again. And then uh, when I wrote the email, I said, do you wanna come to my class again? And then he said, can I bring my fiance? So he would like to come with his fiance. So isn't it a powerful story to like from like that kill three person was in super maximum prison now he would like to come to my class with his fiance. So that's like the power of belonging, power of social capital. It is huge. Uh, even like normally in Canada right now, there are many studies that they found that our social capital as a human being is declining significantly. 
and because of this social capital decline there is also less cooperation and there is this correlation if you have more social capital there is more cooperation more collaboration because we are busy with our social media busy with our phone busy with our own lives we do not have social capital and then we do not have cooperation then we do not have collaboration same story in the prison so the hope i have is prison like healing village or the programs based on purely volunteers like you and so many others who have nothing but good intention and good intention and good amazing willingness they will drive one person i will share and then i will end 75 years old david lloyd um, he is suffering from parkinson he goes from langley to abbotsford three or four times in a week even though he's suffering from parkinson his hand is shaky but he he is my kind of main volunteer when i see him his amazing dedication and commitment magic magic happens so that's that's how i would like to and thank you for listening